China says the number of people infected by a mysterious respiratory virus has more than tripled over the weekend. The World Health Organization holds an emergency meeting today to determine whether to declare a public health emergency regarding the coronavirus. Already some two dozen countries on three continents have shuttered their schools. In Japan alone, 38,000 schools are closed. As the COVID-19 pandemic shot across the globe, Japan appeared to be in the crosshairs. A close proximity to China, home to the largest metropolitan area on the planet, and the oldest population of all nations. Those three factors could have created a disaster. While early challenges made headlines and provided key lessons, Japan is today widely considered a bright spot in the battle against the virus. Among the G7 nations, Japan has had the lowest COVID mortality rate. In fact, the United Kingdom, which has about half the population of Japan, has had more than 10 times the number of confirmed cases and nearly 30 times the number of COVID deaths. And while the pandemic impacted all economies within the G7, Japan's GDP decline has been less severe than its peers. Experts point to some potential factors contributing to Japan's success. First, a universal healthcare system, which for nearly 60 years has been available to all. Early adoption of mask wearing, which was already a cultural norm in Japan. Next, high-tech tools like Fugaku, the world's fastest supercomputer which can model the spread of pathogens in public places. And advanced retrospective contact tracing by trained medical and public health professionals throughout the nation. Finally, the three Cs, a public awareness campaign that promoted the dangers of closed spaces, crowded places, and close contact with others. But as the Japanese government encourages social distancing at home, it's also practicing social responsibility globally. The world's third largest economy is playing a key role in the COVAX facility, pledging more than $130 million toward the goal of equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines. It's an investment that could bring a return of billions to Japan in the coming years, while elevating the nation's role as a global leader. And an acknowledgement that global access to vaccine brings the fastest end to this pandemic in a world where no country is truly an island. Thank you and welcome uh, to everyone joining in Japan, the United States and across the world. I'm Alex Kazan, I'm Managing Director for Global Strategy at Eurasia Group. And I'm thrilled to be moderating such a fantastic panel of luminaries all of whom are playing critical roles in the global fight against this pandemic. We'll cover a wide range of topics today, uh, starting with some stock taking to better understand uh, where we're at. On the one hand, as of this week, uh, vaccines are starting to be distributed in the UK uh, and elsewhere soon. Um, but on the other, the pandemic is still raging in many parts of the world, especially in the United States, and many are forecasting a bleak winter ahead for the Northern Hemisphere. We'll then turn to the economic impact of the pandemic using Japan as a case study, uh, and we'll conclude with a discussion of what to expect in 2021, focused on the key challenges ahead. Let me now introduce our panel, uh, starting with Dr. Larry Brilliant, who is the CEO of Pan Defense uh, Advisory and a renowned epidemiologist and philanthropist. Uh, we're also joined by Gargi Ghosh of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, where Gargi serves as president of global policy and advocacy. Angela Huang is group president of Pfizer's biopharmaceuticals group, and we look forward to her insights on vaccine production and distribution. And finally, we're honored to be joined by Minister Nishimura, who is the minister responsible for economic revitalization in Japan. Dr. Brilliant, let's start the conversation uh, with you. Uh, you know, we've seen this absolutely astounding development of uh, what appear to be very effective vaccines in a remarkably short period of time. Um, on the one hand, how did we get here so fast? Um, but also, how would you describe the current state of the pandemic, uh, both in the US, where things seem to still be uh, in a very intense phase, and also globally? Thank you, Alex, and hello, everyone. 
If, if I might, I would take a couple of pages from that great English novelist, Charles Dickens, whose book, A Tale of Two Cities, begins with the memorable words, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And clearly it is the worst of times in the worst pandemic of all of our lifetimes and the worst pandemic in the past 100 years or more. We are seeing a second wave in some countries, a third wave in others. I wish I could say that we were at the top of that wave and it looked like Mount Fuji where the incline and the decline were about equal, but I'm afraid that the next two or three months, especially in the West, will continue to rise. And at the same time, it is the best of times because as the virus has grown exponentially, so has science grown exponentially. The idea that this virus was in a bat 14 months ago, and in two months, we will be having a global vaccine program, a vaccination program with the largest in history. The sheer audacity and wonder of being able to create mRNA vaccines that had never been done before. The fact that 150 vaccines are in the pipeline, but also the rapidity with which over the next two or three months, we'll see rapid tests based on uh, antigen tests, on CRISPR technology, on LAMP technology, on PCR technology. I'm very optimistic three or four months from now. I'm very worried about the next three or four months that we get there. And, and not to leave uh, without going back to Charles Dixon's, the name of his book was A Tale of Two Cities. And I think the pandemic today is a tale of two different kinds of countries. My friends in East Asia, in Japan, in Singapore, and Vietnam and Taiwan, they look at the West, particularly the Americas, and they say, what did you do wrong? And we look at them and say, what did you do right? So we are living in a world that is the best of times and the worst of times. And it's two very different worlds, depending on where you are. And in the next six months, we're going to go from the pain of the next three weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks, and then I hope the beginning of an opening into our summer when things look like they're getting back a little bit to normal. Thanks, yeah, Alex. And we'll, talk, and we'll talk a little bit later about some of the, the lessons uh, to be learned. Um, but on vaccines, uh, Angela, if we could turn to you. I mean, Pfizer is obviously playing such a, a central role here. Could you just walk us through, um, you know, sort of, the range of effectiveness that you would expect from sort of the broad uh, number of vaccines that will be deployed in the coming uh, year. Um, you know, what are some of the, what does production look like? What are some of the challenges uh, ahead as vaccines are produced uh, and deployed uh, throughout the world? Well, thank you, Alex, for inviting me here and uh, giving me the opportunity to share our story. Uh, since the beginning of the year, I have been part of Pfizer's effort um, on what once we thought was impossible, developing a vaccine in record time to protect, protect people around the world. So it's been just an extraordinary journey, which began in March when we announced our collaboration with BioNTech on a potential corona vaccine. From there, we outlined a five-point plan to unite the entire industry. We would harness our scientific expertise, manufacturing capabilities to him, whoever we need, um, to whoever needed it in the industry to bring forward solutions for the pandemic. One of those solutions was a vaccine program of our own. And so we applied that same sense of urgency to examine the timelines that we would use in our vaccine development process and to challenge ourselves to do things differently. So for example, we came into this process with not one, but four investigational vaccine candidates. Typically, we would test these sequentially if there was in a, in a you know, traditional world, right? To determine which of, the, which of the four to take forward. But in this time, we just didn't have that opportunity. So we tested all four in parallel. And this is one of the first steps that really enabled us to move fast into phase three. 
Another example would be that in our clinical trial, we were equally rigorous in identifying areas for parallel processing where we use services like electronic patient diaries so that we could really speed things up and be flexible. We also commend the global regulators who often responded to our data in real time so that we could keep our trials running as efficiently as possible. And so with all of this help, we were able to accelerate our timelines. And just to give you some other examples, we expanded our dosing from our first trial participant to dosing 20,000 people in just 35 days. This would be something that would just be unheard of in the past. Now, more recently, we released the phase three data from our clinical trial that showed our vaccine candidates efficacy in preventing COVID-19. And so it's become a moment of incredible hope, not just for us, but for the entire world. And it came at a time when we really needed it the most, with the infection rates rising across the globe, as, we, as we've just heard. So now we're working on regulatory reviews um, around the world, and we're going to be able to start distributing our vaccine candidate. As we just mentioned, the UK was granted a temporary authorization for emergency use for our vaccine, and they began their vaccinations today. But we've also initiated rolling submissions around the globe, including in Japan, in Australia, in Canada, and in Europe. And we're currently preparing for a US FDA review later this week. In the meantime, we're working closely with dozens of governments so that if it's authorized, our vaccine can quickly reach their priority populations. So we're entering into a new phase now where our focus is gonna be production, distribution, and administration of vaccines at an unprecedented scale. And in preparation for this, Pfizer and BioNTech have ramped up our manufacturing capabilities across the world. So if our vaccine candidate is authorized, we expect to be able to produce globally up to 50 million vaccine doses now in 2020, and up to 1.3 billion doses in 2021. What gives us the confidence that we can do this is our track record of vaccine discovery and distribution, which spans more than 130 years. We know that our supply chain works because we've been using it throughout our phase three trials, delivering our vaccine to clinical trial sites around the world. We've also developed packaging and storage innovations in order to meet the needs of our global network. And finally, our distribution is built on a flexible, just-in-time system, which can quickly ship the frozen vials to the points of vaccination at the time of need, thereby minimizing the need for long-term storage. We've been getting ready for this moment from day one, and we're confident that we can bring our breakthrough vaccine to the hundreds of millions of people around the world. Thank you, Alex. Great, thank you so much for that, Angela. Um, Gargi, I wanna bring you in now for sort of a global perspective uh, on this. Uh, what is, you know, what do the challenges look like when we think, at vac uh, when we think about vaccinating at a global scale, um, especially in a lot of the world's developing countries uh, where the challenges around infrastructure uh, and all these things are, are, are so much more intense? How do you, how do you approach that problem? Thanks, Alex. Um, I agree with Angela and Larry that we needed some hope at this moment, and it is hopeful that we have not just one, but several uh, efficacious vaccines within sight. And of course, ending the pandemic requires everyone to be protected. The world's just too interconnected to leave anyone behind. Um, I think the prospect of the Tokyo Olympics, which many of us are looking forward to, is a great example of that interconnectedness. But we've seen some epidemiological modeling that makes it really clear that a globally coordinated vaccination effort ends the pandemic and saves more lives than pure self-interest. And that's what we need now. Typically, uh, as you say, low and middle-income countries do often lag, sometimes by years in access to medical interventions. And that's a function of uh, cost barriers. It's a function of delivery structure, cool chain requirements, healthcare workers, um, act accelerator is the global partnership designed to solve that for COVID because we don't have those years to wait. Um, it's a partnership of government, um, healthy 
agencies, civil society, philanthropy that's working end to end, um, um, working with research and developers, uh, researchers and developers, all the way through purchasing and distributing COVID vaccines. Um, we met our 2020 goal of raising $2 billion. Um, many thanks to Japan's leadership on that. They were an early um, supporter of the Act Accelerator. Uh, and it will need the world to come together in 2021 to finance a global vaccination strategy. So we can do with COVID vaccines. And one thing I wanted to follow up on is the role of trust in, in a successful vaccination uh, effort. Um, Gargi, through your work and, and the, the work of the Gates Foundation, you have so much experience in vaccination campaigns across the world. What are some of the lessons or, or experiences um, that you could share in terms of that role of, of building trust, uh, both in institutions and in the science and the vaccine itself? Sure, it's going to be critical to making sure everybody who needs a vaccine gets one. Um, look, we have uh, multiple products in site that are uh, the result of um, highly credible organizations working with stringent regulations. Um, as Reese Angela and many others say, um, and that provides confidence in uh, the scientific side. We also know people need to um, be reassured through their own personal trust hierarchies. So we need to activate government leaders, um, leaders in society and entertainment industries and in, in families and communities among the legislators to make sure that we are um, reassuring people and meeting where they are, meeting them where they are um, and conveying credibility of the science and the products. And ultimately, this is about restarting economies, restarting lives, and I think the benefit of that um, as we begin to work out vaccines will be absolutely essential. And Angela, what's the role for the private sector and pharmaceutical uh, industry specifically in building that trust? Is there a, a role for you there? No. Um, absolutely. Uh, and I think that um, the, the development of the vaccine has been just a great example of, um, of the need to demonstrate trust. Um, we have uh, and we recognize that in order to build this trust, we first need to help the public to understand the safety standards by which the vaccines were developed. And here at Pfizer, um, the, the, uh, the approach that we've taken is that we've really focused on frequent as well as upfront communication. We're publishing our protocols for the clinical trials. We um, have um, we uh, created an open letter to the public um, where we laid out all the steps that it would take for a vaccine to get regulatory approval so that people understood what our own expectations were. Uh, we also initiated and signed a vaccines pledge with eight other companies outlining our commitment to uphold the integrity of the scientific process. So we recognize that we are just one part of what must be a whole society approach in which vaccine education sits across both the private as well as the public sector. And it's really with the collaboration of industry, government and NGOs, all of us working together that we can help close that trust gap and to build the public confidence that we all really need so that people are motivated to get vaccinated, which is the only way that we can end the pandemic. So Larry, turning to you on this, do you think that we can close that trust gap? I mean, you see some of these surveys um, in, you know, asking people, do they trust, are they willing to, to get vaccinated? Do they trust um, and you see very, very wide variation across countries, as high as 90% in places like China. Um, but in some places, uh, half the population says, no, they don't have trust that vaccinations are safe. What's your perspective on this? Can that gap be filled? You know, the first uh, vaccine uh, that was produced by Edward Jenner in 1797 uh, was actually the taking of a, um, some pus from the finger of a milkmaid who had contracted cowpox and putting it into the arm of a little boy named Danny Phelps, who was then immune to smallpox. What a colossal leap of imagination that cowpox could protect someone against smallpox. Because of that, the entire new process was named after the cow, which is vacas in 
Latin. That's why we have vaccinia, the very first vaccine in 1797. But the first anti-vax movement began in 1798, a year later. And by 1805, there were magazines and political cartoons showing pictures of people who had gotten vaccinated with bovine characteristics, bulls jumping out of their arms. Uh, in India, during the smallpox program, in order to make the vaccine, we had to grow the, the virus on, on cows and then sacrifice them. It was the most rigorous anti-vax movement because cows are sacred in India, and yet people had to make that choice. I think it's a complex subject of why people react so strongly against vaccines. I do know it doesn't help when it becomes politicized. And unfortunately in my country <clears throat> and in others, we have seen that politicization. But uh, Gargi, I would say to Bill Gates who flew into uh, Kano in Northern Nigeria at the height of the polio eradication and the anti-vax movement against polio to sit down with the imams and to explain to them what the importance of that vaccine was and he was successful. And by him flying that far, he endeared himself and, and, and brought trust. It's going to take acts like that. I'm encouraged when I hear that presidents, at least four of them, will be willing to bear their arm on television and get vaccinated. I'm thrilled when I hear that the uh, executives of big corporations all over the world are willing to get vaccinated uh, in front of their own employees. We will build trust by being the heroes that we want to be, by being the good citizens that we want them to be. Uh, just talking, I think, isn't going to do it so much as examples and the right use of media and a, a friendly demeanor. But I'm optimistic. Um, I will say one more thing. And, and this is maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask uh, Angelina, I, w I don't want to put you on the spot, but first, congratulations for Pfizer. Um, uh, what you've done is unbelievable. In your first announcement, there was, for me, something so intriguing was that perhaps the vaccine would have this quality called PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis. And when I looked today at the data that had been released, indeed, it looks like there is immunity even in the first few days. If that is the case, we will be able to perhaps use this new Pfizer vaccine in ring vaccination, in using it for outbreak control as we did in Ebola, in the Congo, and in smallpox all over the world. If that is the case, vaccine hesitancy will decrease when you're using the vaccine, not for routine vaccination, but for stopping of a deadly outbreak. So I'm curious, you don't have to answer now, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but uh, a lot of epidemiologists are hopeful that we will find that uh, characteristic. Thank you, Alex. Angela, quick, quick response to, uh, to Larry's question. Well, I think my response is, um, you know, we uh, we have to stick with what we know today, which is the, the clinical trial that we conducted. And in that clinical trial, um, it was a two-dose regimen that was tested. And it is absolutely true that what we learned was that we began to see efficacy after the initiation of administration of the first dose, um, but that that 95% efficacy that we uh, were looking for came um, at the end of the second dose, seven days after the second dose, actually. So um, what this tells me is uh, first and foremost that um, in order for this vaccine to be effective and to do the job that it's meant to do, we need to complete um, the two dose vaccine schedule that it was meant and designed to do. But at the same time, we all should, the, the public should feel confident that from the very first shot, they are getting protection. But to get the full protection, they need to um, finish the um, to finish the schedule. I think what you're right. touching on, Larry, is um, just the fact that there is a whole lot more to learn about the disease, about the uh, just the um, the direction that this uh, the particular virus is going, and uh, what we can actually uh, learn with this with the vaccination programs um, that we are initiating. So certainly we are continuing the studies that we have, right? The studies that we have initiated. We're going to be following our patients, the 44,000 people, for two years. Um, but in addition to that, there will be other studies that will be initiated to help us really get under 
um, under the hood of um, how to really solve for this pandemic and, and other variations thereof. So I think it's a, a lot of more to come, but for today and what we know is that we have something that works and it comes in the form of a, of a two dose regimen. So thanks very much for, for that, Angela. I wanna shift the conversation now to the economic impact of, of the pandemic, uh, which of course has been massive across so much of the world, um, and focus a little bit on, on Japan's experience, which I think potentially does have uh, lessons for other parts of, of the world. We saw in the intro video, some of the, the features of Japan's response, uh, and we're, we're very uh, uh, fortunate to have uh, uh, Minister Nishimura with us uh, today. Um, uh, uh, Nishimura-san, if can you sort of walk us through uh, Japan's uh, experience and what the strategy was throughout the different phases of of the pandemic? Um, you know, focused on uh, managing and minimizing the the economic impact, and also, do you think that Japan offers lessons for the rest of the world? And if so, um, what are some of those lessons? Well, thank you. So I will be very brief. Well, first of all, in case of Japan for April to uh, May, we had a big outbreak. We don't have a mandatory uh, lockdown system legally, as in the case of Europe, but uh, we had issued a declaration of state of emergency, ask people to stay home and uh, close businesses widely. That was a request made. And as a result of that, the number of uh, infected people were able to come down quite a lot uh, from uh, uh, April the 7th up until May the 25th, during which period a declare, declaration of state of emergency had been in force, at which time infection cases had gone down. But in July and August, uh, once again, we had a surge of outbreak. We employed a focused approach on region and on the businesses and ask the, them to close the businesses and shorten the business hours, which was effective. No declaration of state of emergency there. And third time around, we are now faced with a third wave of outbreak, which is much bigger than the first and the second round. And I will come back to this later, if I may. And as the intro video has shown, the death number is very low in Japan. There are few reasons for it. First of all, we have a UHC system. All the people are covered, insurance, and uh, they have a free access to the uh, medical care. That is one big reason. And also the level of our healthcare level is very high, inclusive of the remote and the local areas included. And also this time around, as for the COVID-19, CT had worked very well. One time, the hospitals have been criticized as, as being having a, a large number of CT, but uh, per 1 million, US uh, number is 45 units. But uh, in case of Japan, we have 111 units, three times larger than that of the uh, United States for the population of per 1 million. So as a result of that, we can detect early the pneumonia cases, which had helped a great deal in suppressing the death number. And uh, we had taken advantage of lessons learned from uh, April to May, and uh, we had a good number of knowledge for the treatment. Demidesimil and the dexamethasone, the approval had been given, which had proven to be very effective in the hospital setting. And also the heparin, which prevents blood clot has been used, and it is widely used. And uh, people are recommended to sleep face down because uh, one gets uh, higher damages in the lung, so it's better to sleep face down. And also, due to the registry-related research, there are people who have a higher risk of getting severe, and there is a marker which are involved, and we have a certain knowledge of that. It's not only limited to the elderly people, people with underlying conditions. It all depends on the people who have a high risk of uh, getting severe. So early detection and early treatment is very necessary. And also based on that, for April, May, a wider range of sectors have been asked to close their businesses. 
and uh, ask the public to stay at home. But uh, for July and August, we focused on the region for asking the business to be closed, like Osaka, Nagoya, in metropolitan area. In case of Tokyo, it was more wide because we have a bigger metropolis area, but Osaka and Nagoya, with a population of uh, 3 million, the area have been focused for our application of the measures. In Soho, half of the Soho area of Manhattan, for example, in these areas, uh, business have been requested to be closed earlier and so forth. So it was a very well-focused approach that we taken. During the summer, we were able to uh, reduce the number of uh, infections and uh, we had uh, conducted economic analysis. Uh, two things came out to be clear. For one thing, there is a risky area which had received a priority test of PCR. And second, the request for the closing of the business have been done in a focused manner so that uh, stop the mobility of people from a high risk area to go elsewhere so that we were able to successfully cut down on the infectious cases. For the PCR test, in case of Japan, asymptomatic uh, patients will not undergo the test. We focus on the high risk areas for giving PCR tests during the summer, the evening time entertainment area, like bars and the clubs, inclusive of uh, asymptomatic people, PCR tests have been conducted aggressively and asked the businesses in that area to close, which proved to be effective. And also in general, I would like to say that uh, mask wearing is very useful as shown in the video. During the spring, it was about 80%, but now more than 90% of Japanese people are wearing masks. However, this time around, we are seeing the surge in November. For the half a year period, maybe people had developed fatigue out of a corona, and the younger people think that they have a lower risk of getting severe, so that, that they tend to take off the mask and have a large gathering and enjoy dining and drinking together at the restaurant and so forth. And uh, that is the venue for the community spread. So for the restaurants, we are recommending people uh, that uh, wear masks if you are not conversing while at the eating place. So we take a liberal approaches. We don't have any penalty. Stay at home and the request for closing the business, it's only a request, not a mandatory measure. So there is no penalty attached to it. And the mask is not a mandate. And also for the restaurants and so forth, we do have a guideline. And the guidelines have been observed by many of the shops voluntarily. And we provide a certain subsidy, like $10,000 or more of a subsidy uh, to the establishment so that uh, it is being uh, effective for preventing the further infection. And one more point, for containing the spread of the virus, we have to work on the economy at the same time as, uh, as the video showed, the supercomputer Fugaku and using the AI much analysis have been conducted. Look at the movie theaters. So it's uh, the number of uh, people allowed in were limited during the April and May, but now it's uh, in full operation. People can come to the fullest capacity because uh, we had to track to how the droplets spread using the supercomputer of Fugaku. What happens if the popcorn is having eaten while enjoying the film? And we had all done the tracking analysis, and now uh, we are admitting all the people to fulfill the movie theater to the fullest extent. But of course, uh, we have to keep a social distancing as well. And uh, measures are taken, but uh, certain constraints are applied. So if the virus spreads further, then there is a possibility that we may ask for further closure of the businesses and so forth. But uh, right now we haven't seen any evidence where within the movie theater, infection had spread. So we will continue with the ongoing measures. Look at the professional baseball game and the football game. The stadiums can be filled up to half of the capacity and the cameras have been located in various different places looking at the uh, avoiding the three C's and so forth. So 
every primary school student knows what the C's are. So cameras and sensors are located, and uh, if uh, three Cs are observed, then the alarm will go off and so forth. Something like that is going on. And during the concessions, uh, people tend to gather, and the CO2 concentration is uh, monitored. So is the restaurant and so forth looking to the effectiveness of the ventilation, and we have our data to prove that. If it goes over 1,000 ppm, then it's a proof that uh, ventilation is not working. So it's better to remain uh, within the 500 to 600 ppm. So there's a sanitation law and regulations and we are looking into the concentration level of a CO2, trying to prevent the congestion from happening. So uh, stadium is now half a four at this time. And if we can prove with the evidences, we wanted to have it to the fullest extent, but come November, we had a research of the outbreak. So it is still kept at half four for the stadium. But we will continue to have a good data analysis and employ economic measures and the world's number one super contributor Fugak will be used and AI will be used and a good analysis of data will be done. So making sure that the economy will keep on running. However, more, much more than before, we have a wider spread of the virus now in Japan, over weekly average per 100,000 population, it is over 10 infections, which is a big number for Japan. So if this situation continues, then of course uh, it could overwhelm the hospitals and uh, beds are being filled up. Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, and Hokkaido, Sapporo in these areas the request for shortening the uh, working hours for the shops not until not going beyond 10 p.m. in the evening or 9. And uh, as a result of that, the people's mobility had been reduced. So we hope that uh, we'll be successful in containing the surge. And uh, Japanese people have a uh, high expectations on the vaccination and 70% of the people have a uh, high expectations on the vaccination. But uh, as was mentioned before, the side effects create a lot of problem way before in Japan. So there are some in Japanese community who are so much worried about the vaccination, but uh, Pfizer's vaccine is something that uh, we have a uh, high hope on. In case of Japan, the phase two clinical trial is being conducted if safety is uh, recognized and we hope that uh, uh, it will be approved for the uh, Pfizer's uh, vaccine. So we like to have a uh, containment and the economy at the same time. But uh, if it goes beyond a certain threshold, then we might uh, be in need to take uh, additional actions and measures. But I hope we could contain the virus. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for that, uh, Nishimura-san. Um, Larry, you opened by talking, by referencing Dickens and talking about a tale of, of two cities or two sets of countries. Um, why was the experience in the US and Europe so different from what the minister just described in Japan? Oh, I think that uh, the, our Japanese brothers and sisters took this very seriously. Um, I think all of East Asia, having had experience with two other coronaviruses, SARS and MERS, uh, South Korea, particularly in Taiwan, uh, took this very seriously. And, and throughout East Asia, uh, the practice of face mask wearing uh, was a great help. Um, I think in the United States, uh, it became politicized so quickly that um, it became a, uh, an object of derision, not an object of respect to wear a face mask, which is very sad. Um, but we are also a very close minister now to 80% face mask wearing in the United States. Uh, sadly, we have some pockets with 100% or 98% and others with only 40 or 50%. Um, you can see that in the US today, the virus is spread by latitude. Uh, the cooler it is right now after our holiday season, um, the more the disease is going. But I'm optimistic um, that we are getting on the right track and we have a whole new team coming in. Uh, that will help to do that very quickly. Then I wanted to turn to, to Gargi to talk a little bit about the economic impact on the developing world. 
um, you know, we focus a lot on the bigger economies. Uh, and uh, Eurasia Group recently, just last week, released a report for the WHO um, estimating that 10 major donor countries would accrue more than 150 billion in economic gains next year uh, and almost 500 billion uh, over the next five years if there is equitable global distribution of vaccines. Now to put that in context, that context, that is more than 12 times of the total estimated budget for the ACT Accelerator. Um, but that's focused on the impact for, uh, for the richer countries, for donor countries. And I think what sometimes goes unsaid is how devastating this pandemic has been and can continue to be long-term for much of the developing world. And Gargi, of course, the, the work of, of the Gates Foundation is, is focused uh, on the developing world. Um, how do you see that impact? Uh, and can you talk a little bit about how important uh, the ACT Accelerator and, and COVAX are in stemming some of that economic damage? Absolutely. It's the case that for many parts of the world, this has been an economic crisis, just as much, if not more, than a health crisis. Um, you know, we've all looked at the statistics from the IMF about trillions of dollars in worldwide GDP loss. Um, to make that a little more. Uh, real um, seeing 20 years of incredible progress. Um, people coming out of poverty, um, going toward more productive lives, really um, coming for the first time in 20 years. Uh, we're seeing the number of people living in extreme poverty increasing. We're seeing a decline in access to basic health services like prenatal care or routine immunization as economies have to shut down. And as is always the case in this country and abroad, it's the most vulnerable that are hit the hardest. So women have lost more jobs, uh, wages, um, more families have had uh, less support um, and have been hit harder. Uh, and, you know, in our countries, um, in the U.S. and elsewhere, we've been able to mobilize sizable stimulus packages to support families. It's been much less the case in um, the low and is where the Gates Foundation works. Um, the IMF and the bank have been, the World Bank has been very good at trying to get more money out there faster. Countries have been really excellent at gearing up cash transfer programs to get money in the hands of families who need it. It's been more effective when those countries have had sort of digital architecture in place to get digital payments to people. But the other side of this, though, is how do we end this and what's the cost of ending the pandemic? And, um, Really building back and recovering the economy starts with ending the health crisis so that we can focus on reopening economies. And that's where I think the analysis you described is super powerful because you know, we know it will take seven, ten billion dollars for the global coordinated vaccine campaign that we've all been talking about. That's what we need. It's going to require a ton of global leadership and it seems like a lot of money, but if you can that to what we stand to lose if we don't end the pandemic. You know, we're talking about restarting tourism, restarting manufacturing exports, financial services, all of that happens. That's where we get huge gains. You've talked about you know, $450 billion over the next five years just by making the commitments and showing leadership now. Um, and has been you know, the first of the G7 countries um, to come into COVAX, the vaccine, um, uh, the global purchase fund and really we hope that, that they will be an example for many others to come and and launch that um, global vaccination campaign. Great. Thanks so much, Gargi. So we unfortunately only have a couple of minutes left, but I want to use that time to look ahead uh, to next year. Um, and Angela, let's let's start with you uh, just quickly, one or two of um, you know the top challenges that you see uh, in uh, you know, from Pfizer's perspective and, and from a broader perspective in terms of, of rolling out the vaccine and, and hopefully bringing an end to the pandemic next year. Uh, what are the things that you worry most about in terms of creating obstacles to that? Yeah, I mean, certainly 2020 is a watershed year and one that we'll never forget. 
Um, but to your point, um, now that we are on the brink of having this vaccine almost approved, you know, in, in many countries, what we have to do, the big hurdle is getting people vaccinated. Unless we can achieve a, um, a you know, vaccine, a vaccination rate that will allow us um, to achieve some sort of scale where we can create herd immunity, we are going to have outbreaks. And so what's really critical is that we um, get the public behind um, the trust, we we'll have the trust to be able to vaccinate, get them comfortable that this is an important step to ending the pandemic. Um, we have to, well, I have to do my part in ensuring that the vaccine gets out to where it needs to get to, but then I need um, everyone around the world to be able to get vaccinated. And it's only until we all get vaccinated, that's when things can uh, come in, into control. So I think that's the that's what we have to look forward to in 2021. And I can't do this alone. Uh, we talked today about the importance of public and private partnership and how we can all work together to ensure um, the, uh, the health of our people, but but importantly, the health of the economy. Great, thank you. Larry, let's close with you. Um, what do you see as major challenges, uh, but also um, you know, some of the lessons that we've learned and, and reasons for encouragement? Uh, if you can offer some closing thoughts on that, uh, that would be great. Well, well, let me leave everybody with an optimistic story. Um, in the first 75 years of the 1900s, the 20th century, between uh, uh, 500 million people and even more died of smallpox in 75 years, in the 1960s. It was not uncommon for two, three, four, five million people a year to die of smallpox. In 1975, in October, one of my bosses in WHO called me and said, uh, Larry, we think we have found the last case of smallpox variola major in the world. This would have meant the end of an unbroken chain of transmission going back to the pharaohs in ancient Egypt 10,000 years earlier. We met in New Delhi. We flew to Dhaka. We took river boats and helicopters and, and uh, water planes. And we landed up in a little village called Karalia and Iso Arita showed me this little girl named Rahima Banu. And when the scabs fell off her face and the cough, the last viruses left her body and she survived. But when they were baked in the hot sun of Bangladesh, that was the end of that virus's lifespan. Tens of thousands of years, smallpox had become eradicated because of a vaccine because of vaccinations, because of the heroic effort of people from hundreds of countries who were white and brown and every color of the rainbow, every religion, every language, working together under the World Health Organization to throw smallpox into the dustbin of history. And I am confident that with this great explosion of science and the vaccines that we have, we will also throw COVID into the dustbin of history. Well, a very optimistic note for us to end on. I want to thank uh, all of you, Larry, Gardi, Angela, uh, Minister uh, Nishimura. Thank you all very much for a very compelling discussion.